My name is Dennis, and I work as a bioinformatician. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. My boss is Dr. Dan Janis, and in his lab, we are interested in studying the evolution of echinoderms and regeneration. We also put a lot of our time into figuring out how viruses evolve. And Dan is interested in the evolution of bacteria and stuff like that, but that's not exactly what I do. I am mostly a phylogeneticist. I like to work with animals. I am a zoologist, first a bioinformatician, only next. Um, and today, Isabel asked me to put together some kind of a guide for you to start working with RNA-Sac. The minimum you need to know if you consider starting working on this eventually. Now, if you know what RNA-Sac is, and if perhaps you already took a course on this before, probably not going to be talking about anything new to you. I really prepared this for that first timer person that never heard about this before. Okay, so RNA sequencing, RNA-Sac, was first introduced in 2008, and over the past decade, decade, it has become more widely used owing to the decreasing costs and the popularization of shared resource sequencing cores at many research institutions. Now, since the first publications, coining the term RNA-Sac, appeared in 2008, the number of publications containing this word has grown exponentially. Last year, we had 6,877 publications on PubMed, and the numbers are only increasing. Now, the increased popularity of RNA-Sac has led to a fast-growing need for bioinformaticians uh, to work together with other researchers uh, and also people that can put computational resources together in order to make this work. Uh, in order to bench scientists to correctly analyze and process large data sets, they will need to understand the bioinformatics principles and the limitations that come with the complex process of RNA-Sec analysis. Will you need a big computer? Not necessarily, but most labs will need some kind of backup structure, some kind of system or server, uh, local or in the cloud, that they can use to store data for a long time. A regular computer or an external HD drive is not enough. And you're gonna want to talk to your IT personnel to figure out solutions. Now I put together a few high computing clusters myself together back in the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where I got my PhD and also here at the University of Carolina. So if anybody in the call wants to reach me out and talk about hardware solutions and computers, do it. Just write me an email the protocol for RNA-Sec starts with the conversion of RNA, either total or enriched mRNA or depleted RNA into cDNA. So actually there is no RNA sequencing. We are always sequencing cDNA. It's more stable, it's easier to work with that. After this fragmentation, adapter ligation and index ligation, each cDNA fragment is subsequently sequenced uh, to create this read, right? Through a high throughput platform. Back in the days, we used to word that uh, we used to use the expression next generation sequencing in NGS a lot. We don't use that expression anymore. I prefer to use high to proof sequencing or high to proof DNA sequencing instead, HES. Okay, they, they are the same things. Uh, so, this is the kind of te sequencing technology you're going to be using here. And normally, you don't need to understand much about it because you're going to be paying someone to do the sequencing for you. Um, Raw sequence data then is demultiplexed, aligned, and mapped to genes to generate a raw count table, at which point the data often are handed over to the bench researcher to start his or her own analysis. So for the purposes of today, work, today's workshop, I'm going to imagine this overall workflow, more, more common situation, in which you are getting the transcriptomes, the assembled reads from the sequencing facility, and you are doing all the remaining analysis by yourself. We can talk about uh, sequencing transcriptome assembly at a later point. You can email me about that and we will cover a little bit about it next week, okay? But for the, all the purposes of this today's workshop, we're going to imagine that you are going through a sequencing facility that is giving you the transcripts ready to analyze. So the whole process again, but now with an image. We start from the samples and from the samples, we try to extract the RNA. RNA extraction is super hard and you have to be very careful about contamination. It is important to wear protective gear so that you do not introduce contaminants to your samples 
you have to wash everything and you have even to use products like DNA A's and RNA A's that degrade DNA and RNA in the environment in your tools before you start. This is not something that you want to do without having practicing a lot. So if you are going to start working on the lab for the first time, doing RNA sec experiments, you will want to practice first on something else. Once you get the, this material, the RNA molecules are hopefully intact and not a lot fragmented, uh, but you will want to fragment it eventually because we want to break down the molecules so that their sizes fit in this bell-shaped curve, like a normal distribution of sizes of a certain known medium length. From that point on, what's going to happen is that we are going to attach some, certain adapters to the five prime and three prime end of the reeds. Uh, many times there are multiple adapters here. And you can pull reeds together by attaching barcodes that are nucleotide sequences that can associate a certain library with a certain sample. That way you can sequence everything together and use those barcodes to separate the sequences later. This is called multiplexing and demultiplexing. The kits that you buy come with all the information that you need to barcode your sequences and ligate the adapters. Once you prepare the cDNA library, you send it to a, a sequencing machine, a hydrophobic sequencing machine, and you're going to get the sequencing back from that machine. Most of the times, if you are working with RNA-Sec, what you did was you performed some pair-end sequence readings, right? So pair-end means that you're going to have your fragment. There are adapters on the ends of your fragment, um, and the adapters are here in red and blue. And then you're going to read and sequence the fragments from the five prime end and the three prime end, but you normally are not going to sequence it entirely. There is always some part in the middle that is not sequenced, that's the unsequenced part. You're gonna end up with two files, one file containing the forward reads, another file containing the reverse reads. You're gonna use that file for transcriptome uh, assembly and genome mapping. A lot of the uh, sequencing facilities today will do this for you, and then they will give you the transcripts ready to analyze. And this is what you're going to be doing in your lab. You're probably going to be working on differential gene expression, variant calling annotation, novel transcriptome discovery, which is when you cannot annotate because the sequence is new, so you need to do something else, uh, and RNA editing. We will mostly cover today differential gene expression analysis and annotation. Okay. Okay, so first thing you need to know is that there is no true consensus about what is the most appropriate pipeline for an exact data processing. However, there are numerous out, uh, online semi-automatic tools that are available, such as BaseSpace, Metacore, BlueBee, and others. They all come with their own toolkits. Many of them come with tutorials and videos on YouTube that you can look at and follow the protocols that are there. Although most of these tools generate principal component analysis, PCA, uh, and they can display heat maps and they can run different gene expression analysis with plot assistance of a bioinformatician, this is what they don't do. They do not allow users to fully access the quality of their data, determine the accuracy of their own analysis, or even tailor the analysis to their biological question. And this can lead to misinterpretation of the data set. So there is actually no automatic pipeline that you can rely on. And you do need to be able to stop and look at your data and make your own decisions case by case. Okay, there is not a one single recipe that will work for everybody. This is very important. It is important for investigators uh, to understand how to approach their data sets, to appreciate the characteristics of their data set and to watch for weaknesses in the data that may limit the ability to draw conclusions. In addition, it is imperative that each data set be analyzed de novo in the sense that thresholds and methods must be adapted anew, which cannot be achieved by using generic online apps or tools. Again, there are tools that allow you to do everything automatically, and I am explicitly saying that you should not use them. A major goal of RNA-Sec analysis is to identify these differently expressed genes or co-regulated genes and to infer biological meaning from further studies. So the source material can be cells cultured in vitro, whole tissues, um, sorted cells, all kinds of things. Um, and the ability to interpret the findings depends on the appropriate experimental design and the uh, implementation of controls and correct analysis. 
Control is a key word here. You should be thinking about positive and negative controls all the time. Another key word that's not listed in here is replication. It is extremely important for you to be able to replicate your analysis. You should not rely on p-values alone. We are going through what we call the p-value crisis, which is associated to the fact that p-values were never designed to be used the way we use them. Um, and we are slowly accepting that reality and understanding that in science, we need replication in order to confirm our results. The same goes for an ASAC experiment. So whenever you start your experiments on top of the control, keep in mind that you may want to budget for repeating the analysis, just to check if you are right. Every effort should be made to minimize batch effects throughout this whole process because small and uncontrolled changes in the environment can result in identification of differently expressed genes that are unrelated to the design experiment. So let's go over what you need to do to control for batch effect. From the user perspective, you want to minimize the number of people working in the same project. So uh, the same person that is doing RNA extraction should be the same person that is preparing the libraries. That would be the ideal scenario. Either that or uh, you can establish interuse and reproducibility in advance, but you have to control for that. And training people is key. So we need to figure out ways to do that. You should not expect that you'll be able to go to the lab and do this the first time and everything's going to be okay. Now, during the experiment, you have to control for temporal variables. You will have to harvest or kill animals at the same time of the day. You have to think about harvesting controls and experiment conditions on the same day as well. And from an environmental perspective, uh, if samples are to be collected in batches, you, you will want to minimize the time between batch collections. Also, the intra-animal or uh, litter mate and, and cage mate controls should be used whenever possible. Um, so having a, a tight schedule and following that to the letter is extremely important at this stage. There are also biases we need to control during RNA isolation and library preparation to reduce batch effect. From a temporal perspective, we want to perform RNA isolation on the same day, and we want to avoid separate isolations over several days or weeks. Also, we need to handle samples in the same fashion. And this can be challenging if you, for example, if you have a lab in which you depend on students that are having classes and they cannot commit to have to be working uh, eight hours a day, five days a week in the lab. So that means that you're going to have to figure out a way to perform this analysis, giving into account that preparing these libraries may take some time. And you don't want one person to start it and another person to end it. You want the same person to go through the entire protocol. So you have to handle those schedules. Uh, me and myself, what I do when I have to do this is working overnight or working during weekends. So I'm sure that I can be in the lab for the entire time, for the entire process. There are also environmental things that we have to consider. We have to isolate RNA batches and prepare libraries using standard preca uh, precautions to minimize contamination. And again, replication. Not all library preparation and sequencing experiments yield the same results, and the sequences are not truly random. So you need to repeat as many times as possible and prepare for biases that are introduced by the lack of replication, but it's challenging because normally you don't have a lot of RNA that limits replication, and also preparing libraries is expensive. So in here, we are talking about replication in the level of um, RNA isolation and library preparation that is before sequencing. And what I'm saying is that if you are preparing libraries for sequencing, you need, if you can, you would like to prepare several times libraries for the same sample, repeating that experiment two or three times, and it would be ideal to budget for that. Now, during sequencing run, in that case, you want to control uh, experimental conditions on the run, and be sure that you are sequencing everything together, including the controls. Uh, for intra and intergroup variability and outliers, when assessing variability within the data set, it is preferable that the intergroup variability represents differences between experimental conditions in comparison with control conditions. Is, uh, so what you want is that the, uh, the intergroup variability to be greater than the intergroup variability representing uh, and giving into account technical and biological variability. Uh, and, and there are ways that you can access that. We are going to get to that later. Remember that a, uh, we, have, we are having here a global overview of the data. 
Uh, so a global overview of the data allows for the characterization of variation between replicates and whether investigator defined experimental groups show actual difference between groups. A group being a set of replicates from the same condition or the same cell type. Moving on. So, so far we covered, we, we have an overview of RNA-seq experiments and I give you some tips and advices about how to control for batch effects. And I warn you about replication and I warn you about how to identify uh, the importance of it, looking into variability and outliers. How do we actually do that? So one way to visualize the variation of the data set is through PCA. And this is one of the things that I would advise you to learn if you don't know it yet. It's very common in the statistics. You learn it very soon in any statistical courses. Um, PCA takes a large data set as input and it reduces the number of gene dimensions to this minimal set of linearly transformed dimensions reflecting the total variation of the data set. So what you get is a, a series of principal components. For example, PC1 describes the most variation of the data, PC2 describes the second most variation, variation of the data and so forth. Normally you look into PC1 and PC2. Uh, the PCA plot may also help uh, to visualize the groupings among different replicates. We're gonna take a look on, on those clusterizations later and agent identification of technical and biological outliers. So keyword here, learn PCA. Okay, so you learn PCA, you learn other strategies to find out variability and identify outliers. Another approach for that uh, um, to determine inter and intragroup variability is to calculate the distance as represented by the correlation between samples. Uh, you normally use something like the Pearson coefficients or their Spearman ranks for that. The Pearson's correlation reflects the linear relationship between two variables accounting for differences in their mean and standard deviations. And the Spearman's rank correlation is a non parametric measure using the rank values of the two variables. So those things are extremely easy to implement in R if you know which functions to use. And it's much more important while you are studying these topics for you to learn how to read the results uh, because executing the calculations is trivial using a computer. When you do kind of things like that, and you are at this stage of your analysis, you can look into images that look like my screen right now. So in A, we have the PCA analysis, and in B, we have some correlations that were performed using the person's method. So when you get the data, this is from uh, Koch et al. 2018, and we are looking into some uh, transcripts from mice that we have this na naive population and population that receive lung transplants after two hours or after 24 hours of transplantation. Um, but the details are not very important. What is important is that when you do a PCA analysis of a good RNA-seq data set, it looks like this. So you see PC1 explains over 68% of the data, PC2 explains over 20% of the data, and you can clearly see that the groups, naive transplant two hours and transplant 24 hours, they are clustered separately in this graphic. Uh, you may also be interested in looking into their Pearson's correlation. This is a heat map and don't be confused by it. So the line here in the end is always one because the correlation between naive one and itself, it has to be maximum um, and it's a mirror. So the top part is the same as the bottom part. Okay. Um, and, and, and these heat maps often look like this. Um, both the PCA plot and the Pearson's correlation heat map, they, were gen they can be generated using normalized values. So normalization is a keyword here and we need to learn about how to normalize the data. Our, in RNA-SAC, the most common normalization procedures will be RPKM, FPKM, and TPM. So that's reads per kilobase million, fragments per kilobase million, or transcripts per kilobase million. They are not hard to calculate. RPM, uh, RPKM is measuring something related to the number of reads mapped to the transcript over the total number of reads by the transcript length. And this was originally designed for single end reads because nowadays we're normally using pair end reads. We normally use FPKM instead. Their measures are very similar. And CPM is something that normalizes all the RPKM values. Uh, but even if you are using RPKM or TPM, that doesn't mean that the values are normalized throughout different samples. Those values are normalized for your one sample, right? Uh, 
So a common misconception is that RPTM and CPM values are already normalized, and this should be compared across samples or RNA-seq projects. However, RPTM and CPM, they represent the relative abundance of a transcript among the population of sequence transcripts, and therefore they depend on the composition of the RNA population and the sample. Quite often, it's reasonable to assume that the total RNA concentration and distributions is very close across compared samples. Nevertheless, the sequence RNA repertoires may differ significantly under different experimental conditions and are across sequencing protocols. Thus, the proportion of gene expression is not directly comparable in such cases. I am recommending you reading Zhao et al. 2020, misuse of RPKM or TPM normalization when comparing across samples and sequencing protocols to understand this deeper. Uh, this is one of the most common reasons why I reject papers on RNA-Sec. Setting a low count threshold. So remember that I told you that there are no turnkey solutions and you're gonna have to learn certain statistics in order to make decisions about your data set. Here we go. We have that experiment of the mice again. Uh, and the top you are looking to naive versus transplants after two hours, and in the bottom you're looking to naive versus transplants after 24 hours. So we have samples one and two on, on images A and B, samples one and three on images C and D. You don't need to understand the biological experiment. What I want you to pay attention to is that in the top image, you can see that these dots, they kind of start grouping together and forming a line. Those two lines here, they start overlapping very soon. Their correlation is very high, and we get an RPKM of one is a good threshold already right here for these samples. What does this mean? So if we get a gene that has an RPKM that's smaller than this threshold, we throw it out, right, to be more conservative, to reduce false positives. So we define this threshold, throw everything out, everything else out. But in C and D here, we have a situation in which sample tree does not have the same sequencing depth. That means that I did not sequence as, my, as many raw reads from sample three as I did from samples one and two. And when that, hap that happens, when we do not sequence enough, the correlation reduces and we need to get a greater cutoff for our analysis. So in the case of C and Z, the cutoff should be at least an RPTM of 10. So we are throwing out, away much more data. So keep that in mind that if you're sequencing less, you may end up throwing out more data because you're gonna have to use more strict thresholds. In general, a less distribution cutoff allows for more noise or false positives in the downstream analysis and the verification of findings should be performed. In contrast, high stringency may reduce sensitivity and lead to the removal of the genes of interest. Let me clear my mouth a bit. Okay, continuing. So let's look now into differently expressed genes. You, you, at this stage, you already produce your analysis in the lab. Somebody was trained and that same person produced all the libraries and sent all the libraries to be sequenced at the same time at a sequencing facility. They use their own bioinformatic protocols to give you a transcript, assembled transcripts. And from those assembled transcripts, you perform some analysis like PCA, to identify certain thresholds, and you have decided the RPKM for each samples. So you throw away all the genes that do not have that, that certain threshold for read counts, and you are only left with the transcripts that you can trust more. The next step is to compare all those samples and figure out which genes are differently expressed. So two things here. First, let's look into the general approaches, and then let's look into what you need to do before you start actually looking for the differently expressed genes. The first thing you normally do is a pairwise comparison between the two groups, and you use different programs for that. For example, edge R, D, SAC, and cut diff. We are going to look specifically into edge R as an example today. And you can also use ANOVA or other tests like ANOVA to infer the variance across groups. And once you did that, you once again filter out low counts and check and adjust the filtering cutoffs again. So what is edge R? This is one of the things that you're gonna need to learn how to use if you are doing RNA-Sec. Edge R is a package that uh, to identify pairwise differently expressed genes. 
it requires something that is called a raw counts table, which is basically raw reads mapped to each gene for each sample. The raw counts can also be used to filter out background noise. And how do we estimate the variance across these groups? Well, for that, we use ANOVA. Uh, ANOVA tests for differently expressed genes between any set of groups with the new hypothesis that the mean gene expression is equal across all groups. Uh, the result is a p-value representing the significance of the variations across groups compared with within groups with thought defining directionality or which groups are available. Uh, note that because we are using p-values here and we should not trust p-values, again, that keyword replication, if you are repeating our experiments, that gives us more, um, we can trust our results better, right? So why do we use clustering on RNA-seq data? Clustering of RNA-seq data may be used to identify patterns of gene expressions by grouping genes based on their distance in an unsupervised manner. Clustering RNA-seq data is used as an explanatory tool that allows the user to organize and visualize relationships between groups of genes and to select certain genes for further consideration. There are two main types of clustering. Hierarchical clustering creates kind of a tree with clades, quote unquote clades here, uh, which basically puts smaller clusters into bigger clusters. Uh, another strategy is called the k-means clustering. Data points are iterative, uh, iteratively partitioned into clusters based on the minimum distance to the cluster mean, and the number of clusters, which is k, is set by the investigator. So again, another thing that you cannot do automatically. Uh, after obtaining the differently expressed genes using adjusted p-value of 0.05 that you are not going to trust because you are aware of the p-value crisis and you know that those values are not to be trusted. So after you do that, across the different uh, conditions by ANOVA, we use these genes as input for clustering to define the prevalent patterns of gene expression. This is how it looks like after you do a hierarchical clustering. So you have there our samples, same example again, we have the naive plus two hours plus 24 hours. These are for uh, mice that received uh, some lung transplant. Um, and you can see that there is a tree here putting together certain groups of genes, genes that are in red, Z score, red. They, it means that the gene is upregulated, is more expressed. Genes that are in blue, they are downregulated. Those decisions about what's upregulated and downregulated comes from normalized values, and it relates in the end of the day to how many raw reads map against each gene. Okay, uh, and you can split this up into, for example, genes that are most correlated and things that are least correlated. Um, and if you want to be super careful, you probably want to focus only on the most correlated giving into account that you are trusting p-values too much at this stage, and it's better to be more conservative than not. Um, and the same data set now clustered by k-means. So it looks a lot like this image, but it's different. Um, and in this case, we did something that is called the gene ontology enrichment. We are also going to focus on this the next week. We're going to do a, a quick exercise in gene ontology enrichment. And as you can see, what we get is not only which genes are down-regulated or up-regulated, we can also cluster them according to, to what they do. So we have genes associated with cell cycle on the top, then RNA processing, positive regulation of metabolic processes, and so forth. This is the same image, just larger, so you can see how the, the, the heat map looks in the end. Um, and what you want to do if you're doing this for the first time is probably to compare your heat maps with others that you find on uh, trusted publications to see if there is nothing super weird in your images. Okay, uh, another thing, you can select certain clusters. For example, I selected this top cluster here, which is associated with cell cycle. And you can, in, within that cluster, you can enrich for certain geo terms. And that's how you, you end up figuring out what are the main functions that are being active, active or not active in that moment. So for example, we have an up-regulated term here associated with translation and a down-regulated team here associated with in metabolic process. You obviously want to look, uh, both things are super interesting, right? Uh, what is being up-regulated or down-regulated, uh, both things are fantastic. And you always want to 
pro provide this information together with something called uh, the FDR, the false discovery rate. And you want to be sure that you are calculating this Q value beforehand, before anything else that you do and believe in these results, right? Uh, it is yet another reason why I would reject a paper on RNA-seq because of the lack of the FDR information. Okay, in the end, you may have selected a few genes of interest. For example, in black, we have genes that were differently expressed. And in gray, we have other genes that were not marked as differently expressed, but they were interested because of the literature. For example, we wanna know what was going to happen with those genes. Um, uh, and you can see that one way to, uh, to summarize these results is to use ggplot uh, in R to produce these graphics in which you show the gene. You have these conditions here and you have the RPKM or the FPKM or the TPM here. Um, and the higher these values, the more expressed the gene is throughout the experiments. But for you to be able to do all of those steps and follow all of those cautionary uh, warnings that I gave you, you need to start learning a few things. So let's focus on what you need to learn. The first thing you need to learn is Google search. You need to be capable of trying to ask questions online the best way possible. And before asking anybody you're using forums, it's important for you to spend a few minutes trying to find a solution by yourself. And if you want to reach out and ask for the question, uh, for an answer, for some help, you want to give as much information as possible in the moment that you are asking for help. Another thing, you want to learn a little bit about Unix shell. You're going to have a, the opportunity to learn a little bit about Unix shell next week with me. Uh, the main things to learn is how to use bash, what is the standard output and standard error, and how to redirect those, and learning a few commands like CD, PWD, LS, and others, which are simple comments for you to be able to uh, move around in the computer. You also want to learn a little bit of R, but not too much. The most important topics for you to learn in R is exploring basic data structures, inspecting and handling the data, installing and working with the, the data analysis packages. And I do advise you to learn how to use ggplot to, to create the plots. Uh, and I would advise, although it's not necessary, that you learn some Python especially the functions argparse for manipulating arguments, the regex function sys to manipulate standard output and standard error, and learning the module BioPython, especially SAC.io, so that you can process DNA information fast in your computer. This is what I would say you would need to know to be a bioinformatician to be working with RNA-Sac. You really don't need advanced computational skills. Those are very basic, but it does, it does take a lot of hours for you to master this concept. Um, and where you can start learning about these things. You can go to Code Academy, it's free. You can take some courses there. I also frequently recommend Free Code Camp. You can even get some certificates from there. You can take classes on Coursera. They are paid courses there, of course, but there are also a lot of very good free things there. Uh, we now have LinkedIn learning tools that include a lot of uh, applications. Their Python course is very good. Um, and you, of course, can join us next week. So. If you want to, uh, you go to this website, www.denisjacobimachado, which is my name, .wixsite.com slash PSU. Sorry, it's a long website. It's free. That's why it's long. Um, and from there, you will find the slide deck. This is slide deck. All the references that I'm suggesting you reading and information about what we're going to do next week. For next week, there will be an image available on this website that will be able to download. From there, I'm going to make it available by Sunday afternoon. The details are on the website. Meanwhile, if you want to talk to me about RNA-seq experiments, you can send me an email here. Uh, we do not have a lot of time, so I had to rush through a lot of concepts, but I hope it's helpful, especially when later on you get my slide deck and you review my notes in there. Here are the things I can help you with. If your lab is interested in buying equipment for an exact experiment, I can help you giving tips and give you an idea of how much that costs. If you are interested in knowing which kind of computational resources you will need, especially for backup the data, let me know. I can also help you with that or point you towards people that know how to do it. If a program is crushing you and you cannot compile it in a cluster and you need help to compile programs, that's another thing that people often ask my help with, and I can help you with that. 
I can also, of course, share a little bit of my personal experience with RNA-Seq. For example, there is a paper that I published on this topic recently. It's on the references, um, and we, we will use it for the examples on next workshop. With that, thank you very much. And this is the idea. I'm going to open for questions and talk, and we can stay talking as long as you want. And thank you, Isabel, for having me again. I have a, one quick question, and I've been trying to do an RNA seq. I've gotten through the pipelines, gone through all the way to gene ontology. The one thing I struggle with is trying to make these cutoffs uh, in terms of p values and full change. I've read a few literatures on how to decide that, but to me, they seem a bit arbitrary. Um, do you have any uh, advice for that? So they are arbitrary. All of those values are. And not a lot of papers tackle that issue. It seems that a lot of users are very happy into implementing other people's arbitrary cutoffs. And that is very, very scary. So let me go back a few slides. Just let me do this. Uh, I want to show one example and we are gonna use it to discuss how to create those cutoffs. Ah, here we go. So. So for example, there will be one stage in which you're gonna to have to decide one of the important cutoffs, which is the RPKM or FPKM or TPM, whatever value you are using cutoff. And that is a major one because at that stage, you will, what decisions you make here will, will define which values, which genes will be processed later on and which ones you're going to disregard as background noise as outliers. Uh, and in this example here, I'm mentioning this author that for samples one and two that are in images A and B, they say, hey, the RPKM here is one. There was not any statistical test that can be replicated for you to decide that the RPKM equal one is the correct cutoff for images A and B. That is non-existent, nobody created that. And that truly annoys me to the bottom of my soul. So normally what I do is I try to convey my own criteria on deciding those values in the paper and in the supplementary material as best as possible. It's still very hard. In the case of RPKM, what I do is I choose an RPKM, process the value and plot the data again until those lines which correlate the RPKM with the number of genes that pass the RPKM value, I want to make those lines converge, right? Uh, and you can therefore use, in this case, it's an exponential line. So you can use an exponential regression to see if you are increasing the correlation between those lines after you decide different cutoffs. What you wanna do is to define a certain correlation that you think it's good, it's strong, and that is not throwing away too much of your data set. Once what I did was I compared this with certain data sets that were available online. And it appeared to me that if I was cutting off about 25% of my data set at this stage, that was normal, very common, but cutting off 50% will be bad. So it would, I would be mindful of that. I don't want to throw away more than half of my data, of course, right? So yeah, you can do that using an R script and you can even create a for loop for you to do that. So you can easily go there and create a loop in which you, you, you define an RPKM value, remove some genes, check the correlation between the lines again, compare that with the number of sequences we are throwing out and create a table. From that table, you make a decision, you report the way the process that you create that decision in a paper. But again, it's still arbitrary, which is very annoying and there is no way around it as far as I know. Does that help? Yeah, thank you for commiserating with me. Yeah, uh, so by the way, I, I, I was actually, there was a Congress somewhere that I, I, I presented a talk on creating automatic, using machine learning to create, to define those thresholds for us. Uh, and I have tools that do that for other things, not for RNA SAC because it's not my main work, so it, it's not what I spend most of my hours doing. But if you are interested in, I can tell you uh, how far I went. I can even share you my code, I don't care. And if you want to try to 
finish up my work, you can. I just don't have the time to do it by myself now. I always thought it would be interesting to have some kind of approach to define these thresholds in a way that could be reproduced and it was not completely arbitrary, but I have not finished that yet. Okay. I'm gonna take your silence as an okay. I, I'll, I'll, well, if no one else has any questions, I, I would be curious, what, what actual machine learning model did you use? Uh, the person that did my machine learning model before anything else is Kobe Ford. He works with me and he knows most about it. And I use several. So instead of listing them from the top of my head, which I would probably fail to do, I would probably say that this is a, a joint effort between me and him. Um, and the idea behind it was to uh, not exactly create a, mod, create a, a, a program that would always give you the right answer. That was not it at all. We wanted to create a, an approach that was extremely explicit. So if you follow that same approach with a, a, a similar data set, you would be replicating our strategy that way. So we, we still are, would be making some, some decisions in a way that's kind of arbitrary. For example, we arbitrarily defined that 50, throwing 50% 50 of the data out is bad. Because if you assume that everything went well in your experiment, you shouldn't be throwing out that much data. But you can see how arbitrary that is, right? We just, create, we just wanted to create a, a, a robot to make those decisions for us in a way that we, can, we could say, this is the, flow, the, the workflow of ideas that this robot took into designing the thresholds. Does that make sense? Uh, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Yeah, and but that's the best we could come up with so far. Do we have other questions? Hi, I have a question. Um, I am definitely not a, um, you know, very experienced with this. So I'm going to do my best to explain this question as, as well as I can. Um, so with when you get the sequences from um, your RNA seq experiment, I'm assuming those sequences are not like when you when you get the raw sequences, they're not an exact gene, like they might be overlapping some section of a gene. First of all, is that correct? Yeah. So then how do you reconcile the fact that some sections of a gene might be transcribed or you might get RNA, like, well, will you get RNA transcriptions for certain parts of a gene, so certain sections of a gene, more than other sections of that same gene? And mm -hmm. if that answer is yes, how do you, how does that look in the expression data that you're going to get? We are going to look into the files and how the actual digital data look like next week. So let's leave. Okay those details about how actually the file looks like for next mm -hmm. week. And let's just try to answer your question in, an over, in a general overview kind of way using this image. So what happens is that you have RNA data. So you're not sequencing incomes, right? We're only sequencing exons. Mm -hmm. We're only sequencing exons from mRNA that were transformed into cDNA. So okay. what you get in your computer is a file in a certain format. It's called FASTQ. It contains DNA sequences together with information about the quality of each of the bases. Um, and those files, it's a, actually a paired file. We have a, a file one and file two. The first line of file one corresponds to the first line of file two and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and what you are looking at is like one of the sequences is the five prime end and the other one is the th three prime end. More or less, because you are never super sure that Sequences on file one correspond to the beginning of the fragment and sequences on file two corresponds to the end of the fragment. You know that they are paired, but you don't know their order, right? So this is how, how it looks like. So it looks like these fragments here in this image. I think you can see my, my mouse, right? Correct, yeah, I can see it. Fantastic. So uh, let me move this window here. Uh, so you, you look into, you get this, fragments here, they come from the sequence experiments of your fragmented reads. So you have red and purple or red and blue. Uh, they may or may not overlap. So those pairs may or may not overlap. And we use different programs to put those together. In an okay. ideal world, we are looking into working with model organisms like zebrafish, human, monkeys, mice. In that case, you have a genome that you can use as a reference and you're going to use an alignment method 
to align these sequences back to that reference. Mm -hmm. If that is not available, you're going to use some variation of the debridging graphics, which basically try to pierce out this information back together de novo, out of the blue, in the absence of a reference. Um, and if there are, there are different ways to put together the same sequence, that's going to be bro broken up into smaller fragments. So the stages that you go through is from, from this reads that we're putting together, you may get context, which we call the transcript. And those contexts may or may not be complete. Mm -hmm. If you have a reference, you can try to map those contexts back to the reference. That's what we are doing here, connecting the transcript to the genome. You can try to do that if you have a reference. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a reference, you can try to build them anew. And of course, that's harder, and you're going to miss more of the gene variation doing that when, an, uh, when a reference is absent, OK? OK. Uh, this process of identifying where the transcripts connect with different introns and exons, however, and understanding splicing, this would require a reference DNA genome, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't need to do that to do RNA-seq and differentially gene expression analysis. You don't need to have a genome available. But if you do have a genome available, it's easier. If you okay. don't, what you're going to have in the end are those contexts. You're not going to get to a later stage of, of the assembly and get uh, what we call scaffolds, which are more complete contexts. Mind you that those words, contexts, scaffolds, I on purpose did not show them here, and I will leave the discussion for later, especially because they actually their meaning actually changes depending on the problem you are using. Bioinformaticians are doing a bad job into being consistent in the usages of those terms. Okay. So if you're thinking about, for example, me working in echinoderms, normally we don't have reference genome available for most of the echinoderms, so I'm working on de novo assemblies. I put those reads back together using the bridging graphics problems that somebody else wrote, and I get those contexts. I can trust that that context represents a sequence that actually exists, but it mm -hmm. probably will be fragmented. It's probably not going to be the complete gene. Right, mm -hmm. And with that information, in the absence of the genome, I can still tell you which gene families are more highly expressed or down-regulated during a certain process. So for example, okay. in a recent paper that I published on uh, brain, uh, brain regeneration, quote unquote here, on echinoderms, so nervous system regeneration, echinoderms, we noticed, for example, the appearance of certain repetitive elements that mm -hmm. helped during the process of regeneration. But we actually don't know where those repetitive elements are in the genome or how, how variable they are. We are, might be looking to different alleles of the same gene. We don't have that detailed information because we lack the genome of that animal, which is my current project. I'm working on that right now. So, but we still can say, hey, there's this, there's this families here that are of interest. So for example, in that paper, we noticed that th there is an important family of notch-related genes. It's called the notch gene family. And that plays a major role in that process of regeneration. So from that point on, what we are doing now is some gene editing experiments in the lab to see which genes actually do something when we turn them on and off, right? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there is a limit to those questions. Mm -hmm. when you, once you start your experimentation, you want to talk to a bioinformatician and be sure that the questions you want to answer can be answered giving not only what you can do in your lab, but also the background information, which includes reference genomes available to you. Mm -hmm. Does that answer okay. your question? Yes, I think that answers my question. And it also gives me a really good idea of, of how to do experimentation in the future if you don't have the reference genome, which is something I, I hadn't really thought about too extensively. So yeah, thank you for that. The, yeah, you're welcome. I like working on no model organisms the most. Um, and if, if you end up working in a system that lacks references, one way to approach uh, experiments with differential gene expression in those systems is to focus on presence and absence of different gene families and looking into gene families that you know that are of particular interest based on the literature that's available to you. That's a great way for you to start. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to talk more about that later on, don't forget that you can always write me an email. Do you have okay, any other follow-up questions right now?
No, no, thank you. This was really great. And, and thank you for your talk as well. This was excellent. Awesome. I'm pleased. And if you are indeed thinking about putting some time and effort into starting learning this, and you are not an expert, like you're not very good in computers, these are very good places to start. Hey, Denise, I have a question. So when you, in most of the papers, like when they show the results, they, they also show correlations between genes that are upper-regulated mm -hmm. uh, or down-regulated and how they might be, you know, those signalings might be interacting. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that? And, and in, when you're analyzing your data, how do you put together signaling pathways based on your RNA seq? Oh, that's an awesome question. So first things first, I put my favorite paper on that topic in this website. So be sure to go there. I try to make so that the references I put for this talk were open access material. I think that one is not, but it's really good. So it's still there. And I hope you can get from your university. So there is a paper on that in the references. Next, um, when we are talking about these this specific, specific ways to create those correlations, we are normally talking about, let me go here, this is stage of the process. So you were talking about things that happen after we have a hierarchical group of clusters of genes, and we are now trying to see how they relate somehow, right? So when we are working with uh, model organisms like humans, mice, there's a lot of more information available and that allows us to do a lot of cool things like those maps and those correlations. And they are computer programs that normally run online on a server somewhere. You don't even need to install them in your computer that can take your data and you start reaching for certain terms and painting out how those terms are correlated with each other, right? Um, and I will show, although very briefly, one example of that next week. And when you do that, what you get in the end is you get this, you are doing this geo term, when you go into this geo term enrichments, what you are doing is you are aligning a gene that is up or down regulated, you're aligning it against a database. And when you align it against the database, there is background knowledge from the literature that is already available on that database that tells you how different gene families or how different terms correlate with each other. If you are trying to discover new correlations, then you are probably talking about an experiment involving gene editing, and you are very particular trying to see what are the effects of turning, for example, turning one gene on or turning one gene off or mutating one gene and see what happens in, in the expression pattern later on. So that's one thing that you do when you want to know specifically one gene, what's that one gene doing? But when you look, when I create these maps, you don't do that anew, right? You are leveraging on information that's available from, from other people's work. So in that case, what you're doing is using databases like the gene ontology database or other databases like that. And what you're doing is getting the metadata about, for example, this, this geo term here of the translation and this geo term here associated with in metabolic processes they may or may not belong to pathways that are interconnected. And you can simply go to the database and tell the database that you want that background information about how those genes connect, and it will give it to you. There is a question in the chat. Oh, can you read it for me, please? FDR and key value is the same. Not exactly, but when you get, uh, what you are, the Q value, is the Q value is a statistical value similar to a p-value for the FDR. So you're getting a statistic or a probability for the false discovery rate. Uh, how do you get that value? In this, in this particular case, for this particular image, there was a particular R package that produced these statistics. So you were getting uh, a descriptive statistics for the FDR. The problem with all these descriptive statistics is that they come from the same paper from 1925 by Fisher. So it was in a time that based on Popper's research, people were trying to make science more deductive and statistics more deductive than inductive. And they were thinking about ways to introduce ideas about falsification and tests into statistics. So Fisher proposed the p-value at that stage. And, and he said, as an example, he showed how that would be used if you imagine uh, a threshold of 5%. 
And unfortunately, people took that very seriously and everybody started using that p-value of 5% or a q-value of 5%. There is another one called STW. I think it's called STW value. Same thing, it's a description of the new hypothesis, the probability of the new hypothesis. Um, and of course, although Fisher published on 1926 another paper warning people to never, ever, ever use 5% as a threshold for p-values, nobody read that one. Um, and we've been doing it wrong since then. And that leads to the, the, the p-value crisis. So whenever, you, uh, it, although it's important for you to report those values here, they are less important than replicating your experiment. There are many ways that you can introduce replications into this. So one of the ways if, is for you to increase the number of libraries that you are using, that they are preparing, and the number of sequencing experiments. And then more important than the Q value, it will be knowing um, the read counts and how different the read counts are from each other. Because in the end of the day, what we are actually comparing here is how many reads align to one gene versus how many reads align to another gene, right? That's what we are comparing here. All these genes have reads that align to them, but we need to know how, if, if, that, if, if that's significant or not. And the problem is that if you are only preparing one library for one sequence experiment, we know that we are going to have from the same gene, in different parts of the same gene, we are going to have more or less coverage. So the coverage varies across a lot across the same gene. It, it happens, especially when you do not sequence enough and when you do not have different libraries combined together. Um, so you, in that situation, looking to the Q value, helps. Just keep in mind that it's very, very easy to introduce a false positive result here if you are not replicating your experiment. 